Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren, en de Bali is zo'n plek. So, good evening. Welcome, everyone. My name is Jante Mosselman. I'm a program editor here in the Bali. Um, and I could say that it's really good you're here and that you can sit back and relax because you're not missing anything. Um, but to be honest, I don't really know what is going on in the rest of Amsterdam at this moment. There might be gigs in Paradiso or things in the Vondel Park. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, we have a really nice evening planned for you with three very knowledgeable speakers. Um, and we will talk with them about the fear of missing out, about smartphone and social media addiction, um, about addictions and bad habits and how to break them eventually. Um, what else should I tell you? This evening is live streamed, so um, when I come to you with a microphone, uh, uh, please wait till I'm there uh, and also talk into the microphone. That's very helpful. Um, and there's a, a room for some questions, some remarks at the end of the program. Um, I think that's it. We will start with a, a small lecture. And then after that, I will announce the other speakers as well. We have three speakers tonight, uh, Judson Brewer, Willem Kuyke and Sigrid Seidhoff. Um, and I will now introduce Judson Brewer, who will give us an introduction. Um, he is a psychiatrist and neuroscientist, uh, MD and PhD, and a thought leader in the science of self-mastery. And he's combined nearly 20 years of experience with mindfulness and scientific research. Um, he's an expert in mindfulness training for addictions, and um, some of you might have read his book that appeared in 2017, and it's called The Craving Mind, From Cigarettes to Smartphones to Love, Why We Can ho Get Hooked and How We Can Break Bad Habits. So give him a warm applause, please. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here this evening with all of you. Uh, what I thought we could start with uh, this evening is just a very, uh, very brief overview of how uh, habits get set up and how addiction gets set up in our minds. Uh, and then we'll um, quickly move to the discussion and where we can really dive into this more experientially. So what I thought we could uh, start with is a, is a question. <laughs> so, so this is a picture from the royal wedding. Who is missing out? Who is missing out? I thought this was wonderful. Um, so what I'd like to do is just start with showing you, this is a one minute uh, commercial from uh, the uh, American um, weight loss company called Weight Watchers. Uh, and we'll see why I'm showing you this in a minute. If you're happy and you know it, eat a snack. If you're happy and you know it, eat a snack. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, eat a snack. If you're sad and you know it, eat a snack. If you're sad and you know it, eat a snack. If you're sad because you're angry, feeling down, or generally bad. If you're sad, eat a snack. If you're bored and you know it, eat a snack. If you're lonely and you know it, eat a snack. If you're sleepy and you know it, if you're guilty and you know it, if you're stressed, eat a snack. 
If you're human and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're human, eat your feelings, eat a snack. So I don't know if any of you have seen this commercial. It's actually um, not very, it hasn't been seen by many Americans. A friend sent this to me from YouTube. And I talked to somebody at the corporate offices at Weight Watchers and I said, why haven't more people seen this commercial? And she said, oh, it makes people depressed. <laughs> but the reason I'm showing you this is that it's a beautiful illustration of a part of our brain that's gotten hijacked over time. And what I mean by that is, there's the simplest system known uh, to, to humans about learning. And it was actually set up so we'd remember where food is. And you can, all you need to remember is three elements, that there's a trigger, a behavior, and in a brain sense, a reward. So we see some food, because, and when we're hungry, we eat the food. When we eat it, there's a signal that goes from our stomach up into our brain that spritzes this neurochemical called dopamine into a part of our brain called nucleus accumbens, which tells, us, tells our brain to remember what we ate and where we found it. So this process is set up, it's, it's the oldest evolutionary process known. It's not only known for helping us find food, but the same process is used to help us avoid danger. So if we see danger, we run away, we survive to live, to remember not to go there in the future. And this process is actually evolutionarily conserved all the way back to the sea slug, which is, uh, learns very much the same way as humans to move toward nutrient and away from toxin. So a very, very well-known process. Yet, as this Weight Watchers commercial showed, in modern day when food is plentiful, our brains say, you know, I'm sad. I have a great idea. Why don't you eat a cupcake or why don't you eat some chocolate? And then we'll fe I'll feel better. And so we start to learn to eat when we're stressed out. We learn to yell at people when they cut us off in the bicycle lane uh, or, or something like that. It's been really fun riding around Amsterdam. <laughs> Not that I would do that. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, I certainly was corrected with my bicycling. <laughs> so this is a really important process to know because if we can understand this, it helps us start to understand how our minds work so that we can see how these processes are also at play in our everyday lives with other things. So for example, and many of you have probably seen this, this is a video of um, a woman on her cell phone. Let's see if this works. Right. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Oops. In um, so, there's a there's a, there's a university in um in the United States, uh, Yale University. Some of you might have heard of it. It's a it's a pretty prestigious university they had to spray paint on the sidewalk, look up. And I don't think it's because the students that they're admitting are, are less smart, but their phones are certainly getting a lot smarter. And we see this across the world. In China now, there are what they call cell phone lanes. <laughs> this, is not, this is not a joke. I did not Photoshop this, this is real. So that when people are walking like this, Everybody knows, okay, they're not going to be paying attention. Um, if you've been to Germany lately, uh, they've had to put these lights, they've had to embed the lights, the stoplights in the ground because nobody's looking at the crosswalks anymore. So you can see the tram track and they put the lights there so that people will know don't walk in front of the train. Okay. So how does this get set up? Um, there was a study that was done at Harvard University a couple of years ago where they basically simulated a Facebook um, feed. So basically, you know, Facebook's always asking us to talk about ourselves, right? So they gave people an option to either earn money or talk about themselves. <laughs> and guess what they chose to do? And the way that we do uh, neuroimaging studies is we compare two conditions. So we can compare the, you know, earning money versus 
um, looking at face or talking about ourselves. And then we can look at our brain activity to see what gets activated when we're, when we're talking about ourselves. So in this study, when people were talking about themselves, they found that the nucleus accumbens was activated. So this is the same brain region that gets activated with every single known drug of abuse. It gets, oh yeah, the, sir. Better, better, sounds better. Okay, so when we drink alcohol, when we take cocaine, when we smoke marijuana, when we uh, use opioids, when we smoke cigarettes, this, there's a part of the brain called the ventral tegmental area that sends neurons up to the nucleus accumbens and spritzes dopamine. And apparently, when we also talk about ourselves, this also gets activated. And in fact, there was a study that was done in Europe a, a year later where they found that they could predict the amount of time people spent on Facebook based on how much their nucleus accumbens was activated. So there's something inherently rewarding about talking about ourselves. I'll show you a recent study. This was with adolescents um, where this, these were researchers at uh, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles, where they took the adolescents own Instagram feeds and they put them into the fMRI scanner and they showed them pictures. And the only manipulation they made, remember we need, con we need two different conditions to compare. The only manipulation they made was how many likes certain pictures got. And then they could look to see how their brains were activated. What they found was that their nucleus accumbens was activated and so was a self-referential brain region. So this is linking up reward with self. I'll show you the summary slide. This is all you need to remember. <laughs> so how does this apply to things like social media and cell phones? So if we have a negative emotion, for example, or we're bored, um, we can check our cell phone and then we'll feel better. And we'll, we'll dive into this more this evening, but I just wanna show you how this links into the process. And in particular, with certain social media outlets, um, we can, do part of the process like uh, that we're describing as positive reinforcement. So we do something and we feel good. So we learn to do that more, but there's no negative uh, feedback. And I'll give you an example of that. So we might ask, you know, with Twitter, which is reported to help anybody share their voice anywhere across the world. So, you know, we, we think we have a great idea. And then that feels good. And we have that urge to post no matter what time of day or night it is, or whether we're in the middle of an important conversation with our sweetheart who is soon to break up with us <laughs> because we're getting on our phone. And then we get a bunch of hearts or likes or retweets on Twitter and it feels good. And then if somebody goes on Twitter and says, Oh, I don't like, you, you know, that's not good. That's whatever. That's whatever we can say block and then we don't have to hear from them anymore. So then we can just cultivate this culture of people, of our, of our adorers or our fans, or uh, what are they called on um, Twitter now? The uh, trolls, the Twitter trolls. So we'll talk more about this, but I'm just gonna list a couple of things that are unique to social media in particular. So talking about ourselves, as I pointed out, uh, feels good, positive reinforcement. Gossip is sticky. and We can dive into what, you know, what we mean by sticky. Um, you know, when we're distracted, it feels bad. We go on our phone, we feel better. That's a negative reinforcement aspect of this same habit loop. Our phones, phones are portable. Uh, somebody described them as these weapons of mass distraction. <laughs> and it provides the most sticky type of learning known. So intermittent reinforcement, probably many of you have heard this. This is what the casinos use uh, as a formula to get us to play the slot machines. So you pull on the slot machine and you don't know when you're going to win. If it were predictable, it wouldn't be nearly as fun for our brains. It wouldn't be nearly as sticky. But they set up this formula that we win just enough that we keep playing and give them more and more and more of our money. Well, our phones, if we set them up to uh, beep or tweet or whatever, anytime we get an email or when our Facebook feed lights up or when our uh, Twitter, you know, somebody retweets one of our posts, we've got that casino in our pocket. 
as this weapon of mass distraction. So I don't want to leave us uh, at least this part with on a, on a negative note, we might be thinking, oh my goodness, <laughs> the world is ending. <laughs> so I just want to highlight, because we'll, um, uh, we'll talk more about this this evening. Um, there are ways that we can actually hack this process. Uh, so, you know, I don't know where this saying came from. So I'm not going to go into it, but my lab has actually been working on, well, if people are using these phones and distracting themselves in a way that's set up to develop habits in a certain context, can we actually bring our clinic to them? Because they don't learn to smoke. They don't learn to eat in emotional ways. They don't learn to do these, uh, learn these old uh, uh, habits or these negative habits in my office. Can I bring my office to them? So we've actually started developing digital therapeutics where we can make app-based mindfulness trainings to help people work with their habits right in that context. And the one piece here that we can start noticing is we can start replacing these old behaviors. So the trigger is still going to be there. But if we replace that habitual behavior with something like awareness or curiosity, and Willem can talk much more about this, this evening, we can start to take that same process, this process that our brain knows very, very well how to use, and start to hack it in a positive direction. So hopefully that gives us enough um, understanding about how our minds work so that we can dive into discussion and really unpack this a bit more together. So we'll, uh, we'll jump in from there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judson, Judson Brewer. Um, have a seat as well, please. Um, and I also like to announce our other speaker, Sigrid Seithoff. Um, she used to be a GP, but then she co-created Seithoff and Van Empel, Kick Your Habits, um, where she works with, a psychi with psychiatrists and psychologists to help busy people uh, with their habits. And that goes from drinking to working, using the internet to drug addiction. Welcome. Thank you very much for Thank being you. here. <laughs> and Willem Kuiken, he is the director and professor of clinical psychology, and he leads the University of Oxford Mindfulness Center Research Group. Uh, and the, he directs the uh, Oxford Mindfulness Center. Um, and he, he writes, he speaks, uh, amongst others, for The Guardian and uh, for Le Monde. And his research is really, really very interesting. So thank you also for being here. And I forgot to say something in my introduction because I want to thank Anna Speckens from the Radboud University uh, uh, who made it uh, so that Justin Brewer and Willem Kuiken are here because they're here for the International Conference on Mindfulness in Amsterdam. So uh, having said that, okay, let's dive into this. <laughs> Um, because we, we uh, Justin, you told us already quite a bit about how that works in your head, but there's a thing I don't understand. Because Twitter, it gives me negativity quite often, because it's a scary place. I post an opinion and I can be public shamed. It's awful sometimes. Sometimes when I post something, I sit there with big anxiety. And still, when my phone is lying here, I put it on the table on, on purpose and I turn it around so I can see the screen, but I do want to grab it. So why is that? Why is this so hard? How often do you win the lottery? Never. But Still now. Yeah, right. <laughs> so we can think about this in those terms. We never win, yet we keep playing. Because our brain says, oh, maybe this will be the one. Mm. And so with the tweets, you know, negative, negative, uh, oh, maybe this will be a good one. Our brain is thinking, oh, maybe this one, maybe this one. Which is very much like many addictions, you know, just one more drink or one more smoke or one more whatever. So in that way, it's similar to drinking and smoking and all of those. In what way is it different? In what way is social media or Twitter in particular different? different? Social media. Yeah. Uh, so I like the simple definition of addiction being continued use despite adverse consequences. <laughs> it's very simple, but it covers... So classically, we used to think of addiction being some chemical, you know, like alcohol or 
cocaine or whatever. But more recently, the world is really waking up to all these behavioral addictions. And a lot of these have come into the psychiatric and the psychological literature as like bona fide addiction. So internet addiction, for example, or video game playing is, has now just made it into the world stage as a true you know, a- addiction. So I think as these behavioral paradigms become more addictive, because we didn't have video games 50 years ago, not uh, the ones that are, especially the, uh, those that are extremely addictive, so we've had to change our paradigms to suit what our world is. And you know, we now have cell phones. We now have video games. We now have things like that. So I would say there's more similar to all these addictions than is different. Same neural pathways, same types of compulsive behavior, and even the same types of drive, you know, these continued use despite adverse consequences. But that's just, I'm sure um, Willem and, and Ingrid also have things to say about that as well. Because Sigrid, you call them bad habits and not addictions. Yes, because I think, or we think, that um, actually it, it's the question whether it's so interesting if you call it a bad habit or an addiction. Um, there is The difference is not a qualitative difference, but it's quantitative. Um, so it's not an essential difference. And then um, I think I'm more interested in whether people are bothered by it. So. Um, whether it's an addiction or not, is very often also a political question. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, you, if you call it addiction, then it uh, gets maybe into this DSM, that's the Diagnostic uh, Psychiatric uh, Manual, where uh, if you are true psychiatric disease, you get in there, and then that means that, there are, that people make uh, treatments, that healthcare insurance companies start paying for the uh, for, for these um, therapies. And I think it's more like, um, I think so it's a more important question, what are we doing with these habits? And habits are becoming more and more important in our lives as we society becomes more impulsive. And then I think, of course, there's a heredity uh, predisposition in addiction and in bad habits, but it's also true that If you really practice a habit, like buying uh, dresses at the Zara, (laughs) and you really do that quite often, you become, it becomes a compulsive thing, uh, and you become kind of addicted to it. So I think everybody can train to become addicted or having a bad habit, but it's also the other way around, that you can also train yourself to, to, to let it go. And there, I think, mindfulness is one of the tools that might be very helpful. And do you think everyone can do that? Because we, we, well, I sometimes look at someone, for instance, an alcoholic, and I think, well, if he wanted to, he probably would have changed. So it's, so I, I try to forgive people sometimes because I think they have no choice because they're ill, their addiction's too strong. What do you think about that? Well, I would say, well, I think it's a certain point, especially in substance addictions, like alcohol and cocaine, at a certain point, your brain really gets damaged. That's a fact. But long before that, I think I'm hopeful, and I think that's also what we see at Kick Your Habits, that if you really, if you're motivated and you get real kind of help, um, you know what is the problem? It's often people are so ashamed and these alcoholic uh, people you're talking about, probably every morning they think, today I'm not going to do it. And that counts for blowing, cocaine, uh, smartphones. Every morning you think, no, I'm not going to do it. But then, end of the day, you did it again. And that is such a disappointment. You fail so heavily, and you're so ashamed, that you, 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 people, we've often got people crying when they call us at last and they're at their work and they think, oh, gosh, they go to the bathroom because it's very serious and they start mm-hmm. crying in the bathroom and they drink maybe four glasses of wine a day. And we just think, well, it's a problem. But, but they're so ashamed because every day you try not to do it and every day you fail. And that is why people at a certain point think, well, it's not for me to change this. Mm-hmm. But we think it's possible. Okay. Um, Willem, I want to ask you to react, but also the, the, uh, Dana, Victor, the whole, you're, cause you're so in the dark. Um, 
and I don't like that very much. I, mm. I'd like to, it would be nicer if we, yes, thank you. Hi, <laughs> that's nice. Oh yeah. What do you think <laughs> about changing habits? Maybe just invite the audience to think about um, their partner, or if they don't have a partner, a good friend who knows them really well. And if I were to ask that partner or good friend about you, what's the irritating habit that you have? Do you want me to collect one? No, no, oh, I'm, okay. I'm just, this is just a, a thought experiment. Okay. What's the irritating habit that they know that you have and you kind of know you have it too? <laughs> yeah, does something come to mind? I'm guessing from the smiles that it does. And um, for some of you, you might have been in that relationship for a long time. This is a really long-standing habit. And um, I, I'm very optimistic, actually. Um, there is this amazing quote from the Dalai Lama, which is, um, is that behavioral change or change of our habits, of our behaviors, our minds are not easy. But with sustained practice and practice that's very well structured, any change is possible. And I'll give you an example. I, um, I have two teenage daughters and for a little while I single parented one of them. And um, I had the most overwhelming urge to nag her all the time. Tidy up your towel, put away your breakfast stuff, tidy up your room, clean out the toilet, tell me when you're going to be back, on and on, in my head. But when I did that, I noticed that my relationship with her would deteriorate. And because I was very busy, that was a dangerous thing to happen because then I would close the channels to her to tell me, as she did one night, that there were some boys at her school um, dealing drugs and stealing. And if I had nagged her earlier that day, she would not have told me that story that evening. So as much as I wanted to act on the impulse, I knew that, that it was possible not to act on that impulse. And there is this extraordinary phrase between a stimulus or a trigger, as Judd described it, and our reaction to nag, to pick up our phone, there is a space. And accessing that space is the, is the space for our freedom. Thank you. Um, I want to go back a bit into the uh, uh, social media addiction because it was mentioned slightly earlier that it's different from uh, uh, substance abuse because it maybe it does less in your body. Your, your, your hangover is not really there, I think. Um, but then I, I, I wondered, is it, does that, is it, because of that, that it's less bad, because there's also there's a social aspect as well? Or do you reckon social media addiction is just as bad? Well, in the United States, um, it's now been shown that uh, distracted driving is more dangerous than driving drunk. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to put laws in place to try to keep people from checking their phones while they're driving, which is hard to do, right? How do you check to see if somebody's checking their phone when they're driving? Uh, so in one sense, um, you, know, you can die from uh, withdrawal from alcohol. Some people might feel like they're going to die if they don't have their phone for a while, but they're, you know, they're, they're physically they're not going to. So there, there are certainly some neurochemical differences. Uh, but once those are accounted for, I think there's, you know, the psychological aspect of it is, is virtually the same. Do you agree? Well, well, I think um, special for, for our, us Dutch people is that we might be not so good at football, but if there's, there's one thing that we really specialize in, it's the amount of iPhones we have, or phones, mobile smartphones. There has been in the research in 30 countries all over the world 
And the number one country in the amount of uh, smartphones we have is, is Holland, is the Netherlands. 97% of Dutch people have a smartphone. And um, that also they, that's also been, there's very, there's very little research about smartphones in the Netherlands, but what they find, find is that uh, in general, we look at it 50 times a day that's the general population, but for young people, they look at their smartphone 150 times a day. Um, and I think that means that it is, it is, that's why I think it's so important, this smartphone uh, habit, that it is this constant trigger that you get, this constant stimulus of one part of our brain um, that where, where the, 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 we've got an automatic part of our brain where we're very reflective. That was the accumbens where you had talked about. That's a part of our brain that's very reflexive, it's automatic. And if you get the trigger stimulus there, you react immediately. That's what we do 150 times a day with the smartphone. You hear the beep or you see the little red light and there's only one thing you can do and that's react on it. And this means that um, where we are actually people who are very impulsive and automatic, that's because we've got these old brains, eh? our genes are very old, and what you said is we, 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 we've got to react to every um, impulse there is, because it might be a nice bit, something to eat. And if you get this, this trigger 150 times a day, that means that we, all the time, we are alert. We're never at ease anymore. And I think that's, that's one of the big differences between, um, so habit-wise, between having a thing with alcohol, which for the rest is the same thing, but it is this like having a little bit of drink the whole time, every, every minute of the day, and even we do it during the night. I think that 30% of Dutch people uh, do use their, uh, their smartphones during the night. 40% uh, of us, we, uh, when we're having family dinners, we're on our phones. Um, I think we, we, we are kind of five hours a day, we do things with our smartphones, which is incredible and a problem, I think. What are the other consequences of being so occupied with the smartphone, Willem? I, I, I feel like I'm uh, taking on the role of being the optimist on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> we always need some optimism. Um, I think our smartphones can be an extraordinary asset. Judd and I would not be here this evening if it had not been for my smartphone. Because Anne said, go straight down this road. Just keep going right straight until you get to the barley on the left. 100 yards we met a, 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 a brick wall like this. There was no straight. <laughs> Five minutes later, we were completely lost. So I pulled out my phone and I put it into Google Maps. And here, here, here we are. So I, I think our phones and technology is something that can enable us to live incredibly rich, connected, resourced lives. And I want to answer the question in a slightly different way, which is um, in Buddhist psychology, there are so-called um, cravings. You alluded to this. And there are, there are three types of cravings that um, I think if you look very carefully at your relationship with your phone, you can learn a lot about yourself. So I mean, that's, a, a, if you like, a bit of homework for you. What, what is your relationship with your phone? So the cravings of the three types, the first is um, for pleasure, so for stimulation, a game or something rewarding. Um, another is, and, and within this is, is a sort of identity that we wish that we had. So we're searching for something that is actually, um, uh, 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 that's the kind of person I'd like to be, that's the kind of experience we'd like. And there's a discrepancy there, this is how I am, this is how I'd like to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a sort of, Wanting to block things out, distraction, boredom. You talked about um, positive reinforcement, but there's also negative reinforcement. If I feel yucky, 
or if I feel anxious or agitated, if going on my phone distracts me, that has reinforced <laughs> in a negative reinforcement loop. And then there is a final form of tanha or of craving, which is called um, sort of um, obliteration, sort of annihilation, where we just want to be completely out of our minds. <laughs> we want to be uh, it's a total escape. And that's where you can be searching through websites for hours, and just an hour later you're lost and you've gone, and it's a sort of a, it's a sort of oblivion that you found that is also very rewarding. So I think the optimistic part of this is I think our relationships with our technology can teach us a lot about ourselves, and our intentions, and the, the, what, what drives us, if you like, and whether that's a healthy, wholesome drive or it's something destructive and unhelpful. Because that can be really. Uh, fun as well if sometimes when you lose an hour on Wikipedia yeah. and you get all these new facts that For you sure. can impress people in the pub with that's not ne necessarily a bad thing I think yeah there, there is quite a lot of evidence uh, I think around um, appreciative joy and gratitude that actually if we can learn to savor the beautiful and the good in our lives that actually enriches our lives it makes us feel more connected and happy. And I use my phone in that way. My kids think I'm mad. I think they love me, but they think I'm mad. If I feel overcome with feelings of love for them or appreciation for them, I'll drop them a text. Yeah, I know, teenage girls. But you know, they, they, they come home. They don't, they don't blank me. They like me. And I think the phone there is a way of actually expressing something positive and wholesome, I think. If I could... Yeah, of course. Because it's interesting that Wilm talks about these these positive things, our, our brains are constantly looking for, you know, we call it the, the BBO, the bigger, better offer, <laughs> <laughs> which actually uh, lines up pretty nicely with fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's a simple example? Um, uh, chocolate. So maybe, um, you know, my, my brain has a very structured hierarchy around chocolate. You know, like <laughs> milk chocolate down here, you know, 70%, 70% with sea salt, 85%, and then it goes all the different types of, you know, this brand versus this brand. So our brains are constantly categorizing and saying, this is better than this. Mm -hmm. So we might go and distract ourselves for a little bit where we get this little hit of, okay, you know, this distracts me. But when we compare that to something like Willem's talking about, this um, connection, we're actually disconnected when we're distracting ourselves. And when we we pay attention to what that feels like compared to what it feels like to really be connected. Like when you've just had an amazing conversation with somebody and you look at your watch and it's like three hours later, you know, that is so much better than checking Facebook. And our brains know that as long as we pay attention and can link that up and see that clearly. Yes. Did you want it? But that's the crucial thing, isn't it? To pay attention. Yeah. It's to be aware and to be present. Yeah, you, you must be present to win. <laughs> yeah. So before we're going into how uh, you can make sure that you're present uh, uh, and not scrolling around on Facebook, I want to ask you if you, if you could describe what FOMO is exactly, the fear of missing out. What happens when we experience this? Sira, do you want to? Well, yeah, well um, I think the thing is, we, as human beings, we are social animals. Yes. We, we want to be part of a group. Um, and um, before this, the smartphone in the former century, your group were your neighbors and the kids in your class and your family, and that was, and you had, you communicated with them. And it was very, it was a very clear and a very direct relationship after the smartphone and the internet, um, your group is, uh, you've got a very eerie, strange relationship with your group. And the people in your group, they're not like your neighbor that you coincidentally meet and you say, hey, hello, and the, the neighbor's got their hair like this. And that. But everybody now in your group presents themselves as in their most fashionable, nice, pretty, lovely way. 
Uh, you, you, a family dinner, uh, if you, people make pictures of having a dinner, and we all know that it might be a very boring dinner, but then suddenly when somebody wants to make a picture to put it on Insta, and everybody goes, hi, having the greatest time in the world. So what you see is um, that the group where you belong to, want to belong to, they are much prettier than you are, they're a lot happier, You've got a boyfriend that's much smarter than your own. Uh, they got the nicest uh, dress <laughs> from the Zara that you missed out. And where you before were quite happy with your, uh, <laughs> with your stinking boyfriend. Now you think, gosh. <laughs> and this, this, this thing, you see, parties, of fear of missing out, it's, always a, it's also a lot about parties. You see, every somewhere when there's a, there's a party somewhere else, and uh, I asked my, one of my children, what do you do when you're uh, at a party, but you, and you see on your Insta, because young people you know are not on Facebook anymore, but on Instagram, and you see a picture of a party somewhere else, and you think it's much nicer. So I th and I wanted to hear that he, oh yes, I feel very uh, strict here, I feel ugly. And he says, well, I go to the other party. Which means that you're all the time, you're on your way, you're comparing yourself with other people. And that means, where we also, we, we, I think the thing is also why, why we can't let go, and we, we got to look at it the whole time, is that we know that it's fake. We know that it's, ah! just is rubbish and that it is fake, but because uh, Bill Gates uh, is, knows a lot more about, uh, well, you know a lot about brains, but Bill Gates too, more than us regular people, and they know, they got this, uh, this mechanism into the smartphone about this beep, which gives us this dopamine release. And it's an intermittent, it's an unexpected release, you don't know. Because maybe if there's this beep, you know you're going to get a like, maybe. And you do everything to get this like. And you think, oh yes, now's the like. People, I'm not only part of a group, but people like me too. They love me. And this is the combination of this looking at your peer group, where everybody's more happy than you, together with the impossibility to leave the beep of your smartphone because of Bill Gates and the mechanisms he put into it makes us uh, victims of, um, of the smartphone, where I agree that if you're a moderate user, it's a very helpful tool. I completely agree with Willem, but, uh, but, but in this fear of missing out... Uh, we I have I a think, small test, yeah. uh, which might be nice to do, um, to see how many of us here are really, um, uh, uh, well, experiencing this fear of missing out. You have a, a red card and a, a green card, I think. Um, so red is, nah, I don't really feel that. And green is, of course, yes, this applies to me. Yeah. So we're going to do a few questions and maybe I'll, I'll stop by with yeah. the microphone. What, this is the official, we're going to do the official FOMO scale. <laughs> so. And uh, it's, it's also on the internet. If you want to do it precisely, it's really with scores and so you can do it. But now this is more or less the amateur version. Here they come. First question. There are ten questions. First one. I sometimes wonder if I'm spending too much time keeping on with what's going on. There's the f first FOMO. That's uh, a lot of green. That's a lot of greens. And a bit red as well. Mm -hmm. Two, when I go on vacation or take a trip, I like to keep tabs to keep connected on what my friends are doing back home. <laughs> Very good. Well, we're okay it's, with that. That's quite yeah. some red as well. Yeah, yeah. That's less. Three, I fear that my friends have more rewarding experiences in their lives than me. Yeah. The mix. It's okay. First How? How? Yeah. Four, when I miss out on a planned get-together, it bothers me. Oh, yeah. That's so, a yucky one. All right. okay. Does anybody want to tell me the last time they weren't there with their friends? Who missed out on a social gathering? 
Someone, can I ask you? The last time you missed out on a social gathering. I missed out on a gathering with old friends from Central America mm -hmm. because I wanted to go to an intervision meeting. I thought that was more important. Mm -hmm. And then the intervision didn't go, uh, go on. So mm -hmm. I wasn't at either of them. So I yeah. felt a bit sad. And, and I missed the gathering with old friends. Mm. So, yeah. And in the end, were you, were you, do you think they had the best gathering you could possibly imagine? Or no, but I know they had fun and I wasn't there. Yeah, <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Five. Uh, so can, can I just come in there? Of course. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about your... Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> I, I'm English and um, yeah. we last won the World Cup in 1966. Yeah, and now you're here. And I found out yesterday that this was coinciding with the World Cup semi-final <laughs> with England playing. I feel strongly that I'm missing out. <laughs> <laughs> Should I ask someone? There, now I have various people in the audience who keep yeah. going one, yeah. zero. So, so far yeah. it's, uh, it's good. <laughs> Sorry. But, but luckily you're very good at mindfulness, so this is not bothering you at all. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> he normally sweats this much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Did we really, I fear others are having more rewarding experiences than me, or did we do that one? Or? We did. It bothers me when I miss an opportunity to meet up with friends. Mm. Yeah, that's quite a bit. That's of also a heavy one. Mm. I get worried. Seven. I get worried when I find out that my friends are having fun without me. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I, I get anxious or nervous when I don't know what my friends are up to. Oh, oh, that's good. Oh, there's no problem. Friends. Oh, what a healthy audience. Mm. Here, yeah. it's important that they understand my friends in jokes. Do you read it again? <laughs> <laughs> It's important that I understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> Ten, last one. When I'm having a good time, it's important for me to share the details online. Oh! Healthy. That can't be true. It's not true. <laughs> 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 the problem, the real problem is green one over here. Yeah. Can I ask you something? Yeah. How often do you post something online? Um, I think every single day, actually. Every day? Yeah, on Snapchat and Instagram, but on the story, not like posting a post, but most likely on the story. And why on the story? Um, because I don't think it's good enough to be a post, but then I post it on the story so people can see it and then, and then yeah, it that's it. Disappears. Yeah. <laughs> and did you post something today? Um, yeah, I did actually, because we were riding our bikes to here, and then I posted that I was in Amsterdam. Mm. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I saw a red one over here. You're not overly bothered with sharing on the internet. I never post anything. And why not? Because I'm not on Facebook. Um, well, I, I, actually, this is a little bit of a lie. I, I Twittered. I, I, I did 25 tweets in my life. Mm -hmm. But the last one was in two, 2015, I think. And why did you say goodbye to Twitter? Well, um, I have not, not so much to say to the people. and um, <laughs> Which is a good reason. <laughs> and um, the reason I was on Twitter or LinkedIn, I like to read articles. I think they're very interesting articles that uh, people post. And I'm interested in that, but not to react to these things. Thank you. It, that brings up a question for me. I'd be curious, just for folks to reflect on. When did dinner at a restaurant suddenly become so interesting that we have to take a picture of it? When was that, for anybody that does that, when did that suddenly happen? Yeah, is there? 
a reaction? Shall I come to you? <laughs> Does someone want to react? Or show us your dinner? <laughs> no, no, I mean. <laughs> well, I do it sometimes, but my brother's a chef. <laughs> so I always have that as an excuse that he might want to oh. see uh, when it's a really good. But I'm, I'm probably not the only one. No, maybe I am. Yeah? Well, it's actually when I started seeing other people posting pictures of their food, and I was like, oh, okay, I can start looking, uh, from now on I can start looking at my food if it looks good for my followers, and then uh, when I see something, when I buy a donut or something and it looks cool, then I think like, okay, I can take a picture now, because, yeah, I don't know, it all started when I saw other people posting pictures. Thank you. Yeah, interesting. Mm. Mm. Um, I want to, for the, for the last bit of this uh, uh, session, program, we call it a program, not a session, um, I want to talk with you about what you can do if you're one of the people who had a constant green card. Um, because, because, because you both look into mindfulness as a, uh, a solution for this. But can you tell me what is the scientific definition of mindfulness? You, please. The unscientific definition of mindfulness <laughs> is that mindfulness is a bit like the taste of a lemon. And it is impossible really to define it without actually giving people a taste of the lemon. And I would like to do a brief practice if that's okay mm -hmm. with you all. Yeah. Okay. How many people in the audience have actually ever done meditation before or mindfulness before? Okay. Great. So those of you who have, um, just following what you've already learned, those of you who haven't, it's nothing magical, nothing mysterious. Just like to invite you um, to turn inward and just scan through your body and your mind just now from the bottom of your feet up through your body. Just scan through and what do you become aware of? What do you become aware of in your body? Any particular tension, any particular sensations? whether you feel sleepy or tired or movement in the body. And maybe now also your mind state. What's your current mind state? Do you feel vibrant, excited, dull, tired? Again, just giving a word to your mind state. So you've taken note of the state of your body, the state of your mind. And if you've got a mindfulness practice, just anchoring your attention now on your breath and the movement, the sensations of your breathing. And if you haven't got a mindfulness practice, just putting your hand on your belly and just feeling the movement of the belly through the in-breath and the out-breath. Nowhere to be, nothing to fix, simply bringing your attention with interest to the sensations of breathing. Steady, ease, the sensations of breathing. So I'm going to introduce something to the practice now, and I want you to, as I introduce this, track what happens in your mind and body as I introduce this exercise. So the breath is the anchor. And we've got two helpers who are going to come now, around now, and they're going to bring baskets around the room. And we're going to ask you all to put your smartphones in the basket. And we're going to, in just a moment, take them away and take them to reception for you to pick up on your way out. Just noticing what's happening in your mind and body as you have this sense of baskets <laughs> that will soon appear to take your phones away. What do you notice in your body? Specifically, where in the body do you notice sensations? The belly, the chest, the shoulders, the face. What thoughts are running through your head? What images? Okay. 
let's pause and give people a chance just to shout out what came up for you when I introduced the idea of the baskets coming around the room. What, what did you notice in your body and in your mind? Just shout out. With anxiety, where in your body? Chest, anxiety. Shout out for other people's reactions. Stress. Stress. Midriff. Midriff, yes. okay. Stress is a big word, what does that mean? There's danger coming. Okay, great. Okay. Pressure. Again, where in the body? In the chest here. Okay. Okay. What else? At the back, yes. <laughs> wow. You're doing this with your hand? My God, they're going to take a part of my body away. Okay. Wow. Wow. Any other reactions? We're looking for diversity. Any other diversity? In the, in the middle there, in the back. Yeah. Okay. Now, that's interesting. And you, when you said curiosity, you did this. So it was in your body, and it was a sense of vibrancy, I think I'm picking up. Yeah. Okay. Please. Excitement. Say a bit more. Where was excitement? Okay. Now, that's interesting. So excitement is a positive, neutral, or negative emotion? So you, we heard also anxiety in the same place. Same body sensation. Now, the England football team have been taught... Yeah, I knew that would happen. The England team, <laughs> anxiety and the excitement are the same, have the same signature in the body but it's a psychological label that you've given differently. Now, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so there are a couple more reactions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so a challenge uh, uh, that your mind would say, no, you're not. Yeah, yeah, don't you dare. <laughs> don't you dare. Yeah, yeah. One more. Go on. Yeah. Did you notice something happening in your body? Up in your face. Okay. 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 I, I want to carry on this exercise if, with your permission, but is there anything you want to come in on just at this point? And then I, I want to. No. Please do. Yeah. I think we can come back to the excitement piece in a minute. Okay. But we'll. But right. Okay. Yeah, that's all. So just reconnect with your breath. We're going to carry on with mindfulness. Just reconnect with your breath. No need to shut your eyes. This meditation doesn't have to be with eyes shut. But what I'd like you to do is take the anchor of your awareness, your attention, very deliberately, like a butterfly and settle it on your breath, okay? So the sensations of breathing. So you are like a ship in the harbor here. The anchor is dropping and it's settling on the breath. So your attention is being stabilized and dropped and it's on the breath. And this anchor is gonna be here through the full duration of the next thing that we're gonna do. So stay present. Stay awake, stay alive as we do this. Take your phone out. No, 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 look, you've all gone, then fine, take your phone out, but don't go into automatic pilot. Take it out with awareness. As you take it out, what do you notice in your mind and your body? As you take it out, some of you went like, did you, did you notice that? Some of you went, take your phone out, you went whoosh. <laughs> Yeah, isn't that interesting? That's the 150 times a day. So just take your phone out with awareness, okay? <laughs> He's not gonna take it. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> well, you totally don't know, safe. you don't know. The, the intention of this is an exploration, okay? So take your phone out, don't turn it on yet. The anchor of the breath, what do you notice in your body now that you've got your phone in your hand, if you've got a phone? If you haven't, that's fine, just sit through this breath. What do you notice? Hmm? A, need. a need. What's the need? You want to press that button. Can you feel it anywhere? No, isn't that interesting? Nothing in the body, but I've got a compulsive need. Isn't that interesting? Anything else anyone notices? Curiosity, okay. Excitement. Excitement. Yeah, fun, okay. Okay, so let's turn this thing on. <laughs> shoo, 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 no, 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 listen me up. 
<laughs> Turn it on, okay, with awareness. Just go to the home screen, first of all, the home screen. And just take a look at the home screen, okay? And as you look at the home screen, just let the home screen come in at the eyes. And again, just see now what's happening in the mind, what's happening in the body. Again, shout it out. What's happening in the mind and body as you look at the home screen? A few of you are already scrolling. <laughs> interesting. So basically, trigger, action, dopamine. Now, I'm, I'm just, I'm, there's no shaming in this. That's what's happening. It's, an, it's a behavioral pattern that's running off. Yeah? So we're, we're, we're putting space between the stimulus and the response. What do you notice as you look at the home screen? Restlessness. Now, isn't that interesting? The body is trying to move you to use Judd's language towards the action. Might be one interpretation. Anything else? Relief. Okay, so the message is not there, and you were worried, and, and now that's not there, that's alleviated that. It's negative reinforcement, which we said before. We were afraid of something, that afraid, fear has been moved, and that's been reinforced. Okay? Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah sense of giving ourselves a hard time of not being in the present. Now, of the apps on your phone, which is the one that you're most addicted to? They don't have to answer that because they'll be different for each of you. Which is the one that gives you the most of what Judd described earlier? Press on it. But, but, but don't do, don't do, <laughs> do this. Go to the button, press on it. And as it comes up, watch what comes up in your mind and body, okay? My glasses. <laughs> okay. Some of you are away. Look around the, st look around the room. Some of you have gone. <laughs> You've left the room. Elvis has left the party. <laughs> what came up for you as the app started to load and the information started to come through? Again, in your mind and body. Hmm? Happiness. happiness, okay. Say a bit more about that. What was it that you saw that, and, and what was the experience of the happiness? Only if you feel comfortable. Don't share anything. Yeah? Okay. okay. So the butterflies, and those were interpreted as happiness. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Any more? I saw two notifications and I was terrified. Terrified? Oh, yes. I always think this is public shaming, the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the sheer number. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was okay. Yeah. <laughs> and the terror was experienced where? Yeah, it, in, my, in my chest, but also in my hands. Yeah. I feel shaky. And I can see it in your shoulders. Yeah, high your shoulders. Your shoulders are about an inch higher than they were before we did this exercise. <laughs> now, that's non-trivial. Because if you do that for a couple of hours during the day, you're going to get a headache, and you're going to feel rubbish, and you're going to be more likely to have all sorts of health conditions. Anything else? Yeah. And this is an exploration. Final comment. Anybody else? Anything they want to comment on? I was very relaxed to see that now uh, the voice is I'll step back. I'm just going to see what's happening with the England game, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> so you've done this a lot of times with a lot of people. What is your research? What are your biggest findings? At the moment, we are um, involved in a, a large project with um, 7,011 to 14 year olds teaching them mindfulness in schools. Rates of mental health problems and self injury in that age group are going up a lot. And 
The idea is if we can interrupt and teach people these skills in that age range, can we potentially change the trajectory of people's lives? So that's my biggest research um, project at the moment. And we've done a lot of feasibility and pilot work to suggest that young people can indeed learn these skills, and they can learn them in a way that actually can help them as a resource. And I, I, I personally think that in adolescence and early adulthood, we have something of a I don't know what the right word is. I don't want to use a dramatic word, but we have, um, we have something that we're not doing right at the moment as a society to support young people in learning the skills to support them to lead healthy, wholesome lives. Um, if rates of anxiety, depression, and self-injury, addiction um, are anything to go by. Yeah. do you agree? So when you look at the Dutch situation, Yes, I think mindfulness certainly is a very great tool, but I think it's not enough. And we're discussing smartphones, and I think what we also need to do, because it's so omnipresent, we need to uh, make for ourselves some kind of a diet, and we need to, as a society, to uh, become more disciplined. That's one thing we've got to do. Um, you know, we've got to uh, tell ourselves or teach ourselves that uh, after dinner, uh, no smartphones anymore, several hours a day, you don't do a smartphone, which we sometimes also teach people, but that's very difficult, because, and, what, and that's what they do. They put out the notifications, they say, no, I'm not reachable, but then they get these very angry parents, for example, huh, why aren't you connected? I can't reach you. So it's always, it's, it's even if you yourself try to, to change these habits, it's very difficult. There's one, and the other thing then you've got to do, I think, too, is to, uh, because we are also, um, we've teached ourselves to get this dopamine because of this, uh, looking at our smartphones uh, continuously. We've got to teach ourselves other things that we can get this dopamine from. It's not only we've got to put mm -hmm. diets, but we also got to think about, well, mm -hmm. what other things can we be rewarding in life? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, go bird watching, uh, <laughs> learn to play the ukulele, or uh, uh, we are too centered on the smartphone. There's one little thing I think most people don't know. If you want to know uh, how much you are on the smartphone, there is a th a thing on the, if you if you go in the, on the iPhone to the battery, do you know it? If you go to the battery in the Instellinger, and you go to the battery, you can see there. Um, it says battery gebruik in, in my battery use, and there you can see how often you've been on a game. I'm not going to tell you how often you've been on WhatsApp, <laughs> how often you've been in mail, and it's really uh, it's it's scary. I've got this one game that I've been doing. It's terrible. For the last 24 hours, one hour and, and 10 minutes, which is uh, scary. It, anybody can find it. I don't know about uh, the Android, but that's already a thing where you can check out for yourself because everybody underrates. Yeah? Oh, wait, I'm, I'm yeah. coming. If uh, coming towards you with a microphone, just in case. Justin, you wanted to comment on we'll that. Go ahead. Uh, go okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I go faster. Thank you. Um, just one question. If, if we already have so much trouble with getting rid of bad habits that include smoking or uh, uh, alcohol, which has l way less triggers, I think, uh, how on earth are we able to get rid of the smartphone if we have, on average, 150 triggers a day? Thank you. How are we going to do? Well, the smartphone is going to stay here forever. That that's absolutely is true. Um, we've got to, and I think probably on schools, you've had people, kids learn to bike. And we probably will also go to have trainings and lessons about how to live with our smartphones. And, and that's not going to be easy. And it is probably, I mean, nicotine is already now a really yucky, non, not done thing. Alcohol, it's on its way. And I hope, and I think that in 10 years' time, um, maybe it's like uh, it's not done to, to, to be in a cafe or having a family dinner and your smartphone on, I hope. But it's, it's very hard. It's, it's going to be very hard work. But you've got to uh, see for yourself, also in this conscious way that, that Willem did, what importance and what it's got in your life. 
and that's a thing if everybody's got to do for themselves. Yeah. Judson, you wanted to uh, react? But this is a hall for debate, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm curious about the, the diet piece, because we know from dieting research that diets don't actually work. And in yeah. fact, uh, many of you may have heard this term yo-yo dieting, because we get enough willpower to lose, on average, about 10 pounds. And then we lose that, and it comes back up. And then, we, and then it's this yo-yo effect. So this last piece that you talked about yeah. was really interesting, because you point out this is really hard, right? I work with people who smoke cigarettes, and they're only doing it 20 times a day. 150, and it's, you, can ha you, know, you can do this in your restaurant, where I think some cigarettes are illegal in restaurants here, right? They, no, not anymore. No, no, oh, no, really? No, no, no. In the US, you have to go they got outside. rid of cigarettes in the restaurants. But the, so how can we work with this, this weapon of mass distraction, where we've never before had this ability to quickly self-soothe when something unpleasant is coming up? So I think you and, and Willem actually talked about this a little bit as well, but let's dive into this more, which is, you know, it seems paradoxical, but for example, when we try to help people quit smoking, we tell them to smoke. And they look at us like we're crazy. But we know that we can't trust our brains, that willpower part of our brain, to do it, because if it worked, we wouldn't have these habits now, because we would have stopped. But what we can do is pay careful attention and understand how our minds work. And if our brain, like my chocolate example earlier, you know, my brain's always going for that 85% chocolate from Theo, you know, like this particular uh, chocolate bar, because it knows that milk chocolate, it just doesn't cut it. Willem walked you through this exercise to see what it's like to get on these weapons of mass distraction. You, you might, some of you might have seen that more clearly than you've ever seen that before. You can't unlearn that. Your brain has just learned that. You might forget it. But as you pay attention, you can start to see, what am I actually getting from this? Right? If you're at a restaurant having a conversation and your phone buzzes and you watch this, the urge, and you watch it come up and go as compared to picking up your phone, and you notice what it's like to stay connected with your friend, your brain can dial that in and say, oh, here's connection, as compared to, wow, I checked my phone and it was meaningless, right? Because 85% of the time it is. And so we can start to dial into that piece simply through bringing awareness to what's actually happening so that we can see clearly, oh, Here's connection. This is what this feels like. Where we can naturally develop this, I don't even want to use the word restraint, because we're less excited to pick up our phone when we see that it's not as great as we thought it was. And that's really one of the, one of the interesting aspects of these awareness practices. You know, our phones aren't going away. Food isn't going away. But as we pay attention, when we overeat and we see, oh, wow, this doesn't feel that great, we're less excited to overeat the next time. When we pay attention, when we overindulge in our phone, and we see that clearly, we can start to explore, oh, how excited am I to do that again, when we bring awareness to it. So I just wanted to add that piece in, because it may not be as complicated as you know, setting up a, you know, I'm, okay, I'm going to be off my phone for this amount of time, and set up all these rules for ourselves. It may be as simple as really paying attention and knowing that our brain is looking to see how rewarding something is in any one moment. I don't know if either of you want to add to that, but I, that's where I find this stuff really, really interesting. We may not have to rely on this youngest part of our brain, this prefrontal cortex that we can't trust. Can, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm oh, going to ask uh, uh, him to react first, and then I'm coming towards you with the microphone. Sorry Is about that, that okay? I, yeah. Can I just say something I think quite provocative, um, but really to underscore what's being said? Think about something that is incredibly, incredibly valuable to you. Maybe it's your money. Give me 100 euros right now. Maybe it's your physical presence, a hug or a kiss. 
Think about something that's really valuable to you. I'd like to suggest to you that your attention might be one of the most valuable things that you have. Where you choose to place who you're going to attend to, what you're going to attend to it, and how, I'd like to suggest to you that might be one of the most valuable gifts that you have. Should we just throw it away? We just give it to these engineers that know how to grab our attention to sell it stuff. Mm. So it's a rather radical proposition, but it's a, again, I'd like to just to give that to you as some homework, that we just give our attention away, but it is really one of our most valuable gifts. Think about you're going to die at midnight tonight. There is an app that will tell you how many more minutes you've got left to live. That focuses your attention. Am I going to spend two hours and 50 minutes today playing this game, or am I going to be present to my partner or my kids or do something useful at work? So I, I just want to really underscore that this is not just about phones. This is about a very precious commodity that we have. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. And there's also this, this, this more political thing, is that um, because uh, it looks like in society now there's very much this discussion, is it a addiction or is it not, and should it be paid by insurance companies? But there's, there's another question <coughs> that I think we haven't talked about, and it's about the privacy, what we're giving up or giving uh, to these big companies with all these uh, iPhone jobs and things we're doing. And the, 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 the bizarre thing is that we are being enslaved, not by being uh, 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 but we are being enslaved smilingly, because we go, oh, a beep, oh, a beep. We react on it, we post the thing smilingly, being happily. And, and laughingly, we all are marching into the arms of uh, Zuckerberg and Bill Gates which makes this whole thing, apart from this personal thing, bizarre for me. Yeah. So, um, you wanted to add something? Yeah. yeah. Now, um, that, you must... that you can stop with your addiction, uh, I think you have to feel what the alternative is and that the alternative is better than the addiction that you had. I, I just quit smoking three months, I think. Two and a half months ago, and it was really difficult. No, it was no, it was easier for me than I thought it would be, but maybe that was because of the message of the the doctor. Um, but it was also uh, yeah that I felt uh, really soon uh, that I didn't have the urge that I wasn't busy with with my cigarettes. Do I have cigarettes? The whole I'm far more relaxed now and uh, I don't have to cough so more anymore. So I feel the advantages and may, yeah, that, so, so I know the alternatives. I, I think that's also with other addictions, that you have to know what's that's better. And yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's true. That's, that's also what we do in our, in our clinic, in our center. It's very important that you to at first theoretically think what other things are rewarding in my life. And that can be communication, but it can also be playing guitar or whatever and you really got to practice it, you've got to do it, and then after a while, so you cut, you cut out your, your habit or your addiction, like drinking or smoking or whatever, and then you train and practice yourself, at first theoretically, and then at, at, at a certain point, after a couple of, we always say it's 66 days, then a new thing becomes, that's rewarding, becomes a new habit, rewarding habit. So it's not a thing that comes by itself, yeah. I think we have room for one or two more questions. I'm going to go in here and then further up. Uh, you said something about self-discipline. Uh, I, I, I think you call it another, another way, but explaining that it's not possible uh, to change our own habits by our own. Um, so what will be the tip to fix it? I mean, never, no one is going to ask for help. Oh, well, actually, People should do that. If that was one tip I could give everyone, everyone should do that. But so how could we change that habit first? Um, yeah. Thank you. The, 
If you've, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Chocolat. It's a, it's a wonderful movie where it's during Lent and the, uh, the mayor of the town gives a chocolate for Lent. And he becomes more and more and more chocolate starved and eventually he gets stressed out and he breaks into the chocolate tea and just like goes crazy. Um, and passes out and they, the priest finds him on Easter morning like with chocolate all over his body. Uh, <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's a great image. Yeah, right? The best chocolate. It's a great example of, and I'm not, some people have, they're just born with this ability to have willpower. Very few of them. I have a friend who, she just can do anything. She's like, I'm setting my mind to it and she does it. But for the rest of us, <laughs> we, know, we know how that, how that fails. And there's a lot of research around that. So the piece here that we're emphasizing is to use this precious commodity, as Willem puts it, to understand. So basically, we need to understand two things. One is, how do our minds work? You know, trigger behavior reward from our brain perspective, and then dial into that reward. And ask, this is the second piece, what do I get from this? Mm -hmm. what's, what's so rewarding? And not thinking about it, but dropping into our direct experience and like, what do I get from this? You all describe this restlessness, you know, part of my body, you know, all this stuff. That we're like, wow, that's, that's what I'm getting from this. I'm a slave to this technology. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating. That's the piece that we can pay attention to. And then we can start to see What's it like compared to kindness or connection or simply being aware in this moment? Like when you all started the mindfulness exercise that Willem did, I mean, for some of you, it might have not felt great, but it's pretty amazing to just drop in and be present with what's actually happening. And so that, that higher reward may be available. We just overlook it all the time. You know, like taking a moment to actually pay attention when we're eating a piece of food, even if it's something that we normally eat all the time. Like, oh, what's the texture feel like? Somebody just, I think I heard two people use the word curiosity, right? What does curiosity feel like compared to a craving? Which one does our brain like more? Curiosity? Certainly my brain's like, I'll take that any day. Well, that's something that we all have. and We just have to dust it off a little bit. We can start, you know, practicing being curious. Oh, what's this urge to get on my cell phone feel like? We can even turn it right there where that craving suddenly flips from, oh, here's a craving to, oh, here's a craving. What's this feel like? It's available all the time. We don't need any fancy technologies to point it out. It's, it's you know, it's this precious commodity. So I don't know if that answers the question, but certainly something to explore. Like, what... How's my mind work? And what am I getting right in this moment when I'm doing this automatic behavior? So it's a great question, thank you. It's something that we can all explore. A, a little bit more down to earth, um, a bit easier. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was down to earth. <laughs> but please. <laughs> Because you mentioned this <coughs> self-discipline, which is a, um, a, a very handy thing too to do, is to to choose a very very small thing that you want to change in your life, and that you know that you will manage. It can be this, 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 this just do one push-up, maybe, or just uh, just a very little thing that you know you you'll manage to have to be self-disciplined in and if you try to do that every day this very very tiny thing that way you are training your brain to become a, uh, and then you 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 that will that will kind of um, that will kind of uh, help you to to train other habits to change them so just cho choose this small thing can I, can I just come in and say, uh, again, a very optimistic thing? Mm -hmm. I, I think these things are actually all totally changeable. I really do. I don't think they're easy, but changeable. Yeah. When you were saying about um, um, comparing your boyfriend, um, he's not as good as other people's boyfriend, there are at least four people in the audience where the girl, if you, may I approach you, is that all right? Went you like can. this 
to yeah. their partner and said, oh, no, you are... And touched oh. their partner, oh. including you guys, yeah. as I recall. <laughs> how, how did that feel when that happened? That was using physical contact and using your face and your gaze and presence to actually do some reparation. And I think we can do this all the time. When we understand Judd's cycle, we can do this all the time. I feel angsty. I'm going to go on Twitter. I need something to help me with my angstiness. I'm going to go and have a chat to somebody. I'm going to do something. I don't think it's rocket science. Yeah. I think, a bit like parents don't smoke in enclosed cars with their kids now, ten years from now, yeah. we will be much better at this stuff than we are yeah. now. I, I really don't think it's rocket science. I think Judd's cycle is actually elementary. And ten years from now, your kids will look at you and go, I don't understand why you didn't get that. Why mm. is this? Why are you so thick? Yeah. I, yeah. I think I we have um, room for one more question. Yeah. I'll come fast. Um, yeah, I find this very interesting. Um, I have quite a different approach. I'm, I'm not sure, because you're talking about, like, kicking off the habit or um, like training yourself not to use your smartphone anymore. But um, you, you're like a professional uh, habit fixer or something. <laughs> yeah, but um, the thing is, you were talking about your phone usage and that is quite extreme. And I see you also have like an Apple, uh, Apple watch and everything. So I'm like... Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. okay, is this really working, you know, because you're like the guys that are in front of everybody and you're also using your smartphone a lot. So, like, my approach is I ditched my smartphone, like, one and a half weeks ago, and it's uh, quite a good feeling, actually. Good feeling so far. That's why I was excited, because I was like, oh, these, these guys are going to see my smartphone, or my not-so-smartphone, and I was like, huh. yeah, that's going to be funny. You're, ahe you're ahead of me. Um, yeah, maybe. I'm, I'm not sure, because I don't know if that's the solution, because the world is going in a certain direction, and we're using our smartphone yeah. for a lot of different things. So I'm like, am I like sh fighting a fight that I cannot win, or uh, what, what, is your, what is your take on that? Thank like you. completely like ditching your smartphone and going the other way? No, I think it, it's, it's like William said, it's, it's an amazing tool, but you, we've got to use it more as a tool to get around in the world, to use it as a diary for... But we can't. Okay. I mean, you can't say to look at it. Uh, you know, it's, it's use it every now and then. Okay. So, that, so that's he's really approaching the cool turkey yeah. approach, maybe. Cool turkey. But you also point out something interesting, because we don't need cocaine to survive. But we, we do need food. I think we can all agree on that. The question is, you know, for me, navigating around Amsterdam, forget about it. Oh, sorry. When my phone, when my phone dies, you know, when yeah. my phone dies, I had it the other day. I had, I, my, my battery was dead, and I was lost, and I needed to go to my girlfriend because she was sitting in a restaurant. I didn't know where the fuck the restaurant was. I was like, shit, you know, I was stressed, but my phone died. And I approached the first person that I saw, <laughs> and I asked him, dude, do you know where this restaurant is? And he was like, yeah, man, oh, it's so cool that you're asking this because everybody has a smartphone, you know? And I started talking to this to guy, and he was phone. like an um, Uber food driver, and he knew all the restaurants, so he was telling me, oh, the restaurant's <laughs> over there. And then he was telling me he was, he was throwing parties for people without their smartphones, so people had to put their smartphones in a locker. And I was like, what the... It was like opening my eyes, was like, what? You know, we need this connection, you know? Now you're saying, yeah, I don't need my phone to navigate. What? We didn't need that like 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Right. So, so you bring up a really good point. And you're also showing that it's not binary, right? It's not no phone or always phone. But if we understand how the process works, it puts us back in the driver's seat. Instead of these phones being the driver, we can get back in there and decide, oh, it's going to be helpful for me to navigate to this restaurant now. Or, oh, Maybe I'll actually throw caution to the wind and talk to somebody. <laughs> Crazy. And he was nice. So, you know, when we're slaves, 
there's, there's no control. We're just doing the same thing over and over and over. When we wake up to how much a slave we are, we can see, oh, there are other possibilities and we can explore those. And we can learn how our minds work. When we learn that, we get to be back in control and then we can decide when to use them. So I, I'm, and I love this story about the Uber driver. <laughs> That's fabulous. <laughs> Um, I think this is us for tonight. Oh. Um, Justin mm. Brewer, Sigrid Seidhoff and Willem Kuiken, thank you very, very much for being here. Uh, it was really pleasant to have you. So uh, give them a big applause, please. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, I hope you will join us for a drink at the bar. Um, this was our last uh, program for this season. And I also hope to see you after the summer again. Thank you very much.